know I'm supposed to say something here, but right? can, can we just take some more time and just, I just want to pray. Let's pray. Can we do that, New Heights? God, we just thank you for this time and for this moment, Lord. God, we just want to reverence your spirit, God, and just thank you for moving amongst us, God. We are your people and the sheep of your pasture, and may our souls know that right well. And may we glory, God, in your presence and who you are and that you choose to walk amongst us and be with us, God. And we look forward to the day, God, when even after all of our suffering, that it says that God himself will walk among his people and he will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. We thank you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Man. No, that's what Sunday morning's about. It's about worship. It's not about coming to check off a religious act. It's not about just coming and saying, I showed up. It's about coming to worship Jesus and say, all to your name, be lifted higher. We've been out and we've been doing life in so many different ways and places and hopefully you've been walking as children of the kingdom of God and exalting his name and wherever God has chosen for you to be. And then on Sunday, we come together as the people of God, worshiping our great God. Yesterday I was out and I was speaking at an event And I really felt this way, and Jeff Carroll, he was in the first service, it felt good to have one of my brothers in Christ from New Heights who, he came to my house and he picked me up and we went there and we had breakfast together. And it felt good to know that even after Saturday of pouring my soul out and dealing with some difficult topics, I get to come here on Sunday with my family, right? We're we're families, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and I get to worship God and be refilled and replenished. That's just a, a blessing. And I want to thank you, New Heights. I've enjoyed my time here, and I'm thankful for it. Now we got to get into the talk. You ready? You know, um, it's so funny. It's a, getting ready for this talk as a team. We were working on having like a, I wanted a good sermon illustration to kind of take us into this time. Well, I got to confess something. You know, the theme of this talk is going to be dealing with a lot of Satan's subtle deception. And I got to confess, and I know Lee's right here looking at me, but I got to confess, I practiced a little bit of deception this week, y'all, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I, my wife forgives me already because she was the victim of this deception. Everybody's like, is he really about to make this kind of confession from the pulpit? Well, we have some friends that are dear friends of ours. They were, they've walked in a lot of life with us, and they've been in the military, and they're on the way to Germany. And they give me a call on Thursday saying, James, what are you doing this weekend? whatever it takes to have you to be here with us, right? But they said, we don't want Nicola to know. And that's very difficult for me on many levels. Nicola has this very keen level of discernment of when things change around her. So I'm like, God, you are going to have to help me uh, pull this one off. I didn't ask God to help me deceive her. That wouldn't be a good way to ask it, right? So, So here me and the girls are. We are a family of five, so I, I can tell it. Our house isn't always clean. We want you to come over and visit us. It might not be clean when you come to visit us, though. So here we are in our crazy life. I've got to figure out a way to convince Nicola not to go grocery shopping, to cancel a field trip on Friday that she was going to take with the girls, and we've got to somehow just be in the, in the mood to do all this cleaning up around the house. So that way, we, I didn't want to tip her hand. And so we did a lot of things to try and throw Nicole off the path. We did avoid lying. We just deviated her from the path. But it was just subtle enough to help throw Nicola off track. And we were able to sneak her friends in. And they were great friends of ours. And the wife is here. Master Sergeant Ivy and his wife, Leslie Ivy, are visiting. And I just want you all to pray for them. They serve in the United States Air Force, and they are on their way to be stationed in, in Germany. So thank them for being here uh, with us today in, at New Heights. So that's my confession. I had to practice a little subtle deception, but it was just enough to make it where Nicola didn't know what was happening, right? So that's my confession. We got that out the way. So let's get into our teach, right? We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has been talking about the ethos and the culture of the kingdom of heaven. And he's been laying it out in some ways that are very difficult and very challenging. We've talked about being salt and light. We've talked about the Beatitudes, about being transformed on the inside, being a person who who bears the virtues of the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about pretentious giving and fasting and praying. We've talked about asking, seeking, and knocking. We've talked about being true to your word. We've talked about, about judgment even, that very, top, that very difficult topic of do not judge, right? But I liked how Lee said, and that's going to come up in our talk later. And then even we had Sean last week talking about the golden rule, about loving others as yourselves, right? 
And so now here we are where Jesus has now taught about the culture and the kingdom of heaven. And he's making another statement to us, a command here that I think really is the closing of the sermon, getting close to the closing of the Sermon on the Mount. But I want to tell you a story, and this is not a story that I wrote myself. I took this from Tony Evans' book, uh, Kingdom Agenda. So follow along with me. It's about, once again, not living a life in deception. One day a man was on his way to spend the day with a good friend who lived on a farm. When the man reached the farm, he turned onto a long, winding road that led to the farmhouse. On the way, he had to pass by the barn. But as he drove by the barn, he stopped and got out because he saw something that both amazed and stupefied him. Drawn on the side of the barn were 20 targets. Each had a hole right through the center of its bullseye. There were no other holes anywhere on the barn. Whoever had been using the barn for target practice was definitely a crack shot. The visitor couldn't believe it. He got back in his car and drove up to his friend's farmhouse and said, John, before we do anything else, I've just got to ask you, who in the world did the shooting on the side of your barn? John said, oh, that was me. His friend replied, I can't believe anybody can shoot that well. We're talking about 20 targets with 20 dead center bullseye shots. You mean to tell me you did that? John said, made every shot. Where in the world did you learn to shoot like that? John's friend asked. It was easy. I shot first, then I drew a target around the bullet hole. <laughs> and this is called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. <laughs> How many Texas people we got in here? Even in the first survey, y'all are just, I tell you, man. <laughs> Texas people, I don't know. Anyway, no. Um, God bless you. Glad to know where you are in the audience. But it's this Texas sharpshooter fallacy, right? And it's this sense of this guy is like, he looks like he is living a life that is right on target. Like, man, I'm a dead crack shot. But really, it's deception. You are not a marksman because you shoot and then you paint a target around your shot. And I think what Jesus has done in the Sermon on the Mount, he's been telling us this is what it means to live a life on target. And if you really want to be a person living on target, then you've got to conform to this target. But you can't choose to live in self-deception and think you can just shoot wherever you want, do what you want, and that you still get to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So let's get ready to go into our talk a little bit deeper. The passage we're going to be specifically focusing on is Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 23. But I want to set us up with some questions to help, help frame as we walk through this passage. It's a lot of content, and it's a lot, of, it's a lot to cover. So there's three questions I want us to think about when we think about when Jesus is talking about here, and that way we don't walk in deception. First question is, how do I recognize if I am on the narrow path, and how do I enter the narrow gate? Let's take, hit a timeout. If you want to follow along, some of you are going to be writing frivolous, you know, just frenzically going through this. You can pull out your Bible app, go to events, and then events you'll be able to find New Heights or the Boys and Girls Club. And from there, you'll be able to follow along with my sermon notes. Is it perfect? No, because I'm still a work in progress, okay? I'm not deceiving you here, all right? So first question, how do I recognize if I'm, if I'm on the narrow path and how do I enter the narrow gate? Number two. How do I recognize the difference between good fruit and bad fruit? And the third and final one, how do I know if I'm a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Because that's what we're really here for, right? We want to be true disciples of Jesus Christ, really walking in his kingdom. And you'll see, yes, I'm wearing a shirt today, not just because I want to be comfortable, but I love in our student ministry, the motto in our student ministry is we want to disciple people who know love. We want to disciple students who know love and follow Jesus Christ. And so as I go through this talk today, you'll probably hear me be very passionate, but there's a reason for that. I want you to be people who are not deceived by Satan and his deception. And here we are learning about the kingdom, but then to live a life that misses the mark of the kingdom of heaven will be a great travesty. And I want you to know, love, and follow Jesus and to enjoy the fruit of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. So let's start on the first point and let's unpack that. How do I recognize if I am on the right path and how do I enter the narrow gate? We'll be looking at the first two verses from thir Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And it reads, enter the narrow gate 
For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Let's unpack the statement that Jesus is making here. First part, enter the narrow gate. You know, as I read through this passage, and this was a difficult one, I'll be honest with you, as I read and I read, but I missed this part, enter the narrow gate. Do you catch what Jesus is saying? He has taught all this time. These readers are not getting, they're not getting this in a sermon series like you're getting, where you get to come and go each week. They would have sat there on that hillside with Jesus, and they would have heard the whole sermon, and then he would have gotten to this point. I've taught you all this time about the kingdom of heaven, now enter it. I hear so much love in that statement from Jesus. That here he is, he's taught about the kingdom of heaven, and he doesn't just throw something out there like, eh, now let's see what you do with it. No, he's taught about the kingdom of heaven, and now he, as a good shepherd that he is, he points them to how to enter the kingdom. Can y'all receive that? You know, God's not up there playing games, trying to trick you. He's literally saying, here is my will, and here is my way, and I want you to enjoy life with me. And Jesus says, enter the narrow gate. So he's not playing these guessing games, but it doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say enter the narrow gate like everybody's going to make it in. I don't care what teacher is telling you that everybody's going to make it in. Jesus makes it clear there are two ways. And so he goes on, and, but this is a theme we see throughout Scripture where God presents life to his people. He presents his promises to his people, but you still have a choice if you want to abide, if you want to experience it the goodness and the promises of God. So let's look at some of those themes within Scripture. One comes out in Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. And this is when God has created the garden and Adam is there. And he says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. Do y'all hear that? They're both there, right? Then jumping over to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will certainly die. God has made complete provision for Adam to be able to enjoy his goodness There's only one restriction. Don't eat from this tree, right, because you will certainly die. He's being good, and he's warning him about there's this option here I have that's good for you, but then I have these options over here that you need to stay away from because it will bring your destruction. We see this again in Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel have made their offerings. Cain's um, offering has been rejected, and Cain is upset. But God visits Cain even while his offer has been rejected. Do y'all catch that? He visits Cain and says, Cain, the Lord God said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? In other words, if you choose to walk in my ways, you will have intimacy and connection with me, Cain. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. The walk in the kingdom is not one that can ever be done by accident. It is through an an intentional choice to submit to the will of God. But it's not just about submitting to these lists of do's and don'ts. It's about really submitting to God wants to be your heavenly father. I think Kevin did so well with that in his talk when he talked about worry. Kevin didn't just come up here like, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. But Kevin turned us towards Trust God. He wants to provide for you. He wants to take care of you. And he's saying it here. But then I added one later from Deuteronomy chapter 13, 19, and 20. And here Moses is going over the law with the children of Israel again. And he says this to them. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. But listen here. He doesn't just say, oh, you got to make a choice here. He says, Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to you, to to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you see in each one of these examples of these choices, God is trying to draw you into his loving kindness and his goodness, but, he is, but the good father that he is, he also highlights, 
But if you don't choose this, this is the other option. I think that's a very loving thing to be honest with us, right? I don't want a car salesman that tells me the car is great but doesn't tell me about the fact that the, that the head gasket is broken, right? Amen? So we got this theme where there's these choices that we have to make, right? But he doesn't just stop there about enter the narrow gate. He then goes on and tells us about there's this other option. There's this other path. And he says that there is this wide gate in the broad way. And he makes it clear to us that this path and that this gate will lead us to destruction. What does that destruction mean? Could it mean eternal separation from God? Does it mean that we lose the sense of connection and the blessings of being connected to God? Either way, he warns us, going down this other path. I told you, into the narrow gate, but there is this other path and this other way that will lead you to destruction. But then he goes on with this broad way, and he describes it. And this broad way is what our culture loves today. It's what our flesh loves. And it's not just this culture today. It has been the theme throughout Scripture where God has offered mankind his goodness and to say, walk in my ways and be my people. But then people still rebel, and they turn away from God's goodness and try and do things on their own. Because this broad way is very accepting of sin, it's very accepting of anything, but it will never want to submit and yield to the love and to the will of God. You see, it's wide, it's, it's wide and it's easy to travel this path. But not only that, Jesus says that many people will enter this way. And you know, in this culture, we live in a way where it's like we think that the majority gets it right. Right? It's like on our social media, how many followers do I have? You know, when I put out that political tweet, how many people gave me the thumbs up and it affirms me and my beliefs? You know, how many people can I win over to affirming the position that I take? Can I tell y'all something? Just because the crowd is doing it doesn't make it right. Amen? So this way is why, and see, so don't be deceived by the number of people who embrace a certain viewpoint. Here's the challenge to you today, church. Let the authority of Scripture... And the will of God be what determines your position. You have to be attuned to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You have to let the authority of Scripture and the will of God be what determines the path that you take in life. But Jesus doesn't just tear down the other way. He tells you about into the narrow gate. He tells you about the broad path. He tells you about the broad way. But then he goes on. He tells you the honest truth about the narrow gate. Yes, this, way, this gate does lead to the kingdom, but he makes it honest. It's, it's narrow. Isn't it funny? You know, as I was getting ready for the sermon, I was looking at different way things about false uh, teaching and deception. And many people, when they criticize the Christian faith or they want to walk away from the Christian faith because they want to espouse to some other lifestyle choice or some other viewpoint, do you know one of the common words they use to describe the Christian faith? Those Christians are so blank-minded. What is that? Narrow-minded. Isn't that amazing that that's the word that's often chosen? And here Jesus tells you right from the beginning, into, into the narrow gate and walk on this, the narrow way, right? But Jesus warns you, there is some restriction. You have to be willing to surrender. You have to bow down your flesh and say, God, what you have for me is good. And I recognize that there's this path with all of these people. And it could be easy to take this way, but I surrender. You, God, are good, and what you have for me is good, and I surrender to your love and to your care and to your way because what you have for me is good. And the only way you can do that is by knowing that God is good and experiencing the goodness of God. So what is this narrow way and this narrow gate? I want to make the case to you that Jesus is the narrow way and that he's the narrow gate. In fact, Jesus says it himself in John chapter 10, beginning at verse 7, Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the, sheeps, but the sheep have not listened to them. Hear this. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. In other words, God wants us to conform to the image of his son and his ways and to look at his example. And that is the way we go into the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus makes it clear in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one 
comes to the Father except through me. If anyone ever tries to tell you I found another way to find fulfillment, to find purpose, and to find a way to God, and it does not go through Jesus Christ, they are leading you down the broad way. And I'm not talking about a street in New York either. Amen? So, but Jesus tells us that it's narrow. I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. But he warns us there will be only a few people on this path. So if you're looking to be comforted by the numbers of people around you or amassing this big following, Jesus makes it clear. There's, it's kind of like the Marine slogan, the few, the proud, the chosen, the Marines, right? There's only going to be a few. And are you willing to be able to pay the price to be a part of the few that walk on the narrow way? And I want to challenge you with something, church. You, uh, be ready for this. Brace yourself here. Because to really walk in the kingdom, to walk on this narrow path, You have to be willing to be a cultural minority. And what do I mean by a cultural minority? I'm talking about the culture of the kingdom of heaven. That's what this whole Sermon on the Mount series has been about. The Jews could have been completely comfortable in the culture of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They could have just been comfortable in their religious tradition. But Jesus says, I heard what they told you, but let me tell you the truth. Let me set the record straight. And he's espousing this whole thing. It's like, wait a minute. Jesus, you're rocking our world here. You're making us uncomfortable. Even when he talks about the Beatitudes, those are cultural statements about the ethos and the kingdom of heaven. It's what it means to really be a citizen of heaven. So hear me, church. Let me say this again. No matter what your ethnicity is, what your financial standing is, what doctrinal position you take, or what your political viewpoints are, if you choose to walk on the narrow way of God's kingdom, you will be a cultural minority Because the majority of people are on the broad path and resist the culture of the kingdom of heaven. Can we embrace that together? That we are all children of the kingdom of God? And so here's one more challenge to that. If you try to find cultural identity in anything else above who you are as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, that thing is your idol and it has become your God. And I really, that's my, my, if I'm imploring the American church on anything in these conversations, before you get into your political rant or whatever view it is, and that goes for James as an African-American male, that comes under me being a child of God. I've served in the military, and I love America, but I can call America out when it goes against the ethos of the kingdom of God, because that is the culture that I ultimately subscribe to. Because when I get before God, I don't want to say I was a good patriot. I want to say, I surrendered it all to you, and I followed you and your will and your way. Amen, church? And you say, well, James, that's just you. You're on a political rant here. No, I'm not. Philippians chapter 3. Yeah, I'm going to make my point because right now you don't have a mic, and I do. Um, (laughs) Philippians chapter 3, and this is Paul talking. He says, join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, just and, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. That is a promise that you can rejoice on, that he says, I want to now make you children of the kingdom of heaven, that you reflect his glory. But then he doesn't just say that this way is easy. He says, I got to warn you about this narrow gate. And I just said it. It's not the easiest path. And there will only be a few people that find it. And I want to say this again. Don't be deceived by the number of people who embrace a certain viewpoint. Let the authority of scripture and the will of God be what determines your position. Because if you allow any cultural narrative that is other, that, that you allow to supersede the culture of the kingdom of heaven, that has become your idol and your God. Amen? But don't be discouraged. Once again, people, like, maybe I'm saying this, at, can, can I say this? Like, we're predominantly white here at New Heights, right? Can I get my, my white brothers and sisters to join me in something here? Don't be discouraged if you find yourself as a minority, because no matter what your ethnicity, financial standing, doctoral or political viewpoints, 
if you choose to walk on the narrow way of God's kingdom, you will be a cultural minority because the majority of people are on the broad path and resist the culture of the kingdom of God. And let me tell you something I didn't say in the first service. That even means people who sit in the church. All right? Because this is the only path that leads to the kingdom of heaven. So you have a choice on the path you take. Wait, hear this point here. You have a choice in the path that you want to take, but the destination for each way is already predetermined. You can choose which path you want to walk, but the, the, the destination for each one of those paths is already predetermined for you. Amen? Let's move into our second point. How do I recognize the difference between good fruit and bad fruit? Right? And so let me read this passage beginning at verse 17. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So even Jesus starts this passage off. He talks about the false prophet that is like a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? A very deceptive appearance. <laughs> right? So it's subtle. It's like this sense of he wants to look like he's among the fold of God, but he's not. This false prophet is all about, like he says, they are in really ferocious wolves. In other words, I want to look like I'm a sheep and I want to get in amongst the sheep because I want to consume the sheep. So I didn't catch this one until now. I was talking to someone. They said, James, have you seen the Black Panther yet? How many of you have seen it already, the movie The Black Panther, right? Did you catch in the movie The Black Panther? One of the, wait, oh, sorry, that's right. I can't mess up the spoiler. Never mind. <laughs> there were so many people like, no, don't do it. Plug in their ears, right? There we go. I won't do that one to you. But you'll get what I'm saying. But this ferocious wolf wants to come in, and the ferocious wolf wants to infiltrate and come into the, among the fold of God to divide the people of God. So how does this, this work? So Jesus is not sending in this passage, he's not sending us off on a witch hunt or this thing to go find these false prophets and drag them out to the public square. What he does set us up with in this passage is, I want you, as I'm here right now with you, I want you to recognize when you are getting good fruit and I want you to recognize bad fruit. So I want to challenge you with a question, New Heights, where are you looking for fruit, Right? Because in this passage, Jesus begins to tell the story about this. Do you go looking for grapes among the bushes or do you look for figs among the thistles? And me and Joel were getting ready for this talk and he, we looked up this picture about the buckthorn bush and grapes. And as you'll see this picture up here, that they're actually very hard to tell apart. Do you think Jesus is a good teacher when he makes a sermon illustration? <laughs> right? He's saying from what he's saying with this buckthorn bush and the grapes, when he's talking about the figs and the thistles, what he's saying is from a distance, the fruit of a false prophet will look really close to the real thing. But when you get close to it, you will find it is not the fruit that satisfies. I love when Andrew and them sing that song like, only you satisfy my soul. And so where are you looking for fruit? Jesus said, do you go look for, do you go looking for grapes in the bushes? And this buckthorn bush, one of the things that I learned about it, and Dan is here, and he's an Illinois native. <laughs> and what I found out is in Illinois, this buckthorn bush is supposedly outlawed because it is such a pervasive weed that it will grow. See, I got a, I got a pastor, a retired pastor that's confirming what I'm saying, so I'm not preaching heresy here. Um, it is a sense of it's so pervasive that it will just consume and it'll just take over. Jesus is making another point in this passage. The bad fruit of the false prophet it gets in and it's so subtle and it can seem so accepting because the way it sounds in today's culture is I want to be open and accepting. I want to be able to receive energy and love and this and that. And as people of God, we can find some ways of like, well, yeah, God is love and God wants all people to come to know him. But they're not talking about it. They're talking about we want God and openness and acceptance. We want the broad path on our own terms, right? And Jesus is saying like, this, that little form of deception can get in and just be all-consuming and just take over and proliferate in your life. I liked how one of our college people said when, they were, when she was in with us on our planning meeting, she said, you know, don't get caught up in following people who follow Jesus rather than making sure you are actually 
actually following Jesus himself. And that's the key with the false prophet. The false prophet will draw people to themselves, but not to Jesus. And I like what she also said is you have to really be able to understand the real thing to recognize when you see a counterfeit. And so Jesus helps set us up for that. He then goes on and talks about the good tree and the good fruit and the bad tree and the bad fruit. And so we, let's talk about this fruit a little bit. And so one of the things as he talks about this, this fruit, he's saying that God, ultimately he's saying you want to recognize the fruit, but it's not for us as Lee talked about last week. We're not the ones making the judgment on the person, but we are supposed to recognize the fruit, right? God is the one that will be the one that cuts down the trees and puts them in the fire. That's God's job. But our job is to, as we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we recognize good fruit and we recognize bad fruit. And as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we see bad fruit, we call out the bad fruit, we get rid of the bad fruit, right? When we recognize the good fruit, we eat and consume the good fruit. We don't consume bad fruit, right? So, James, what is good fruit? Let's talk about that. When you see throughout Scripture, part of the ways it refers to good fruit, it talks about character, Christian virtue. That's being good fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, kindness, goodness, and self-control. Also, when it talks about good fruit, it's talking about reproducing disciples who are then the ones that go and follow Jesus. And I'm glad at New Heights, that's an emphasis about making disciples who know, love, and follow Jesus. You know, in student ministry, that's their motto. You know, so Chad is not saying, I want my students to know, love, and follow me. He's saying, I want my students to know, love, and follow Jesus. But if you see Chad, please do love him, okay? And then sometimes good fruit is about doing good deeds. We talked about in the Sermon on the Mount with salt and light, doing good deeds so that people would see your good deeds and they would glorify your Father who is in heaven. But what I want you to catch about this good fruit, this is the fruit that really satisfies your soul and gives you what you need to walk on the narrow way. Some of you as being Arkansans, you probably are hikers, right? You know, you want to have that good cliff bar, or that other that the bar to sustain you on a good long hike. Potato chips probably won't get you through a hike, right? <laughs> Even though that's my weakness right there, potato chips. But, but then Jesus doesn't just leave it there. He talks, he talks about bad fruit. And kind of when I was looking at this bad fruit, it's like, it's this subtle thing because you would think like, of course, you know, sin is bad and doing evil is bad. But part of this bad fruit about this false prophet is, remember, it's subtle. It's like a form of false religion. And this, what does this false religion look like? It could be any kind of teaching that maybe focuses only on observance of external religious things, but ignores spiritual transformation. So instead of you really being a changed person because you surrendered to the will of God and being led by the Holy Spirit, it's that kind of change where you kind of fake it till you make it. Or it's kind of like our Texas sharpshooter. You shoot and just go ahead and paint a target to prove the point that you want to make. You make it look like your life is on target, like you're an expert marksman when you're really not. Right? Maybe it's that kind of teaching that only tells you what you shouldn't do but never has you surrender to what you should be doing for the kingdom of God. Oh, don't do this. We don't do that. We don't do this. But I love our motto at New Heights. It's not about what you don't do. It's about what we are supposed to do, to love God passionately and to love people tangibly. I'm glad that that's our ethos of what we are supposed to be doing is loving God and loving people rather than don't do this, don't do that. No, if you're loving God, God will help take care of the what you should not be doing if you're surrendered to him, right? But then maybe it's that teaching that's about easy believism. Oh, just come in and receive the kingdom of God. And he's just going to pour all these things on about you. And don't worry. You should, as a Christian, you should never, ever have to go through anything difficult. No, Jesus said it. This way is narrow. And it will only be a few people that walk this way. Right? Which is why I'm glad that at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about these things. But he's, making, he's being honest with us in the sense of count the cost to follow me. Amen? Because once again, I want to say this clear, Satan's deception is subtle, but just enough to try and get you off the narrow path. And just even as I read that just now, I was remember when I was in the military, we used, to, we used to have to do this thing called land navigation training. How many of you have ever had to do land navigation where they, they give you a compass and, and these tools? And I can barely remember it, right? But they say you have to know your pace count. You have to know how your distance and how far you go. And what you have to do is, when you learn your pace count, they give you the coordinates of where you need to end up. But the problem is, is as you go out into the woods, there's trees, there's bushes, there's rivers, there's rocks and things that you need to get around. And if at any point you get off course about your pace count and your distance, you will not land at the coordinate. 
And what, when I went out with these um, young enlisted troops when I had just got my commission, and they were like, because I was a chaplain at that time, they were like, come on, chap, let's go do this, let's do that. I'm like, eh, I think we need to slow down. I think we need to be careful here. I think we're kind of off our pace. We're off our count. And sure enough, we, we missed our mark and we didn't arrive at the place. But it was so subtle. One step here, another step there, and all of a sudden, you miss the mark. And that's just what Satan wants to do through adversities and hardships in your life. And there are many things we cannot understand sometimes as we walk on this kingdom way. But what Satan wants to do is just enough deception, just a a few steps here and a few steps there, trying to get you to miss the mark. And it's very subtle. And Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And he says this, and I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. So in other words, Paul is saying, I'm going to be firm in teaching and preaching the gospel because there are some people coming in trying to undermine us. For such people are false prophets, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be their action, their end will be what their actions deserve. So in other words, there can be bad fruit and there are false prophets and we can be deceptive and even false followers of Christ. So you say, well, James, that's great. What are some simple ways I can try to understand the difference between good fruit and bad fruit? One, with a, particularly when it comes to a false teacher. One, is their message consistent with the whole counsel of Scripture, right? Because Scripture will never disagree with itself. Does their life produce the fruit of the character of God? Is what they're preaching, is, are they also living what they're preaching? Are they making disciples of Jesus and not just disciples of themselves? And I know this can all seem very difficult. And you say, well, how can I understand what God's will is? How can I understand his word? I want to recommend a resource to you. It's called Living by the Book. And what I like about this book is that it helps teach you how to to interpret Scripture and how to read Scripture. So that way you can rightfully be able to discern the Word of God for yourself. Because I think that's why many people of God are being thrown off path. Because one, they this remember, we're reading God's Word for His people. He's pointing us to the way. And if you can't rightfully discern it, that's where Satan used subtlety to kind of get you, to try to get you off the path. And just like Lee said, The whole point of this passage is not about us judging the person because we are not judging. The judgment has already been made by an authority higher than you or me. And God tells us what good fruit is and what bad fruit is. So we know that there's a way that we need to walk in. We know that there are false teachers that are ferocious wolves trying to consume the sheep. We know that there's good fruit that we, that we need, but we recognize that sometimes something can look good from a distance, but when you get close and examine it, it's not really what it's representing itself as. But now this third one is a real, one that's really hard for me. It really is getting into this idea of how do I know if I'm a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Picking up at verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. Wow. That's a very powerful one. That's the one that sobers me up real quick, right? And so what is Jesus saying here? We're going to unpack this. But I want you to turn your attention to your, even your bulletin that you got on your way in. And I'm, there's a really good writing in there, and I'm not telling you it's good because I wrote it. I didn't write it. But I want to read this to you to really, because I think they really, the writer of this, of this uh, bulletin really captured what I even felt as I read this passage. It says, when I heard the words, depart from me, spoken by Jesus, I can feel a sense of anxiety and, hopeless, and helplessness. After all, the people who he is saying it to have done extraordinary things. They speak God's voice through prophecy They have power over demonic forces. They do mighty things that I only dream of doing. What hope is there for me? But it may be that contained within these these harrowing words of Jesus is the hope of life, a way to understand the very heart of God. A God who asked for obedience also asked me to give him my burdens so that I can have rest. He says, wait on me and abide in me. He says, come, follow me. He says that he has adopted me as his son or his daughter. When is the last time I answered his longing to know me? Letting go 
looking up at him, calling out, Abba, Daddy. So Jesus is not once again trying to play a game where it's like, we'll see what happens at the end and see what you do. This is a very difficult passage, but what Jesus is really doing to warn us, he wants us to not walk in self-deception. Where we lived our life thinking we are in relationship with him, thinking we are doing, the God, doing God's will, when really we have never surrendered to him and really have never took the time to know him and walk in his will and his way. So I'm thankful that Jesus doesn't let me deceive myself like the Texas sharpshooter into thinking my life is on target when it's really not. It even says this in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8. It says, the prudent understand where they are going, but fools deceive themselves. So trying to live your life, and that's what I see in this culture. For some of what's going on in this culture, to try and make people feel good about the things that they're doing in their life, what do they do? They try and surround themselves with numbers of people to affirm their viewpoint. Even though inside they know that their soul is longing, that they are walking in a way that their soul is just never satisfied. But rather than submitting to Jesus Christ in his way, they choose to walk in self-deception. And that can even happen within the church, right? Jesus says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter. Verbal profession without action and relationship falls short of the kingdom of heaven. And you can say, well, but I believe in Jesus. James says something about that too. James says in James chapter 2, beginning at verse 19, you believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So what makes the difference between demons who know and believe who Jesus is and someone who's a follower? One of the things Jesus goes on, he says, that these people that are claiming these prophetic things, he says, you're not doing God's will. You are not about God's will. You might have these powers, you might be doing these things, but you are consumed with your own desires. You're not doing God's will in his way. And they say, they say, but Jesus, we not even that says, Lord, Lord, you can say, Lord, Lord, but are you doing his will? But then you say, but I'm doing great religious things, right? But he says to them plainly at the end, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Do you catch the tension here? You can say, Lord, Lord, but have you, do you live that Jesus, as Jesus Christ is your Lord? Surrendering what you do on your job, in your family, your resources, your time, your talent, your influence. Have you surrendered that to him? Is it really about doing God's will or is your life set up on about what makes you comfortable, what makes you happy? Or is what makes you happy and comfortable is that I'm surrendered to doing the will of God, and that's what satisfies my soul, right? Because we don't want to be people that walk in self-deception, and that can happen. And we even get warned about that by Jesus in Matthew chapter 15. And he's going on about these people who have said, like, they've tried to change the word of God to the Pharisees, really. They tried to change the word of God to fit whatever their will or their purpose is. And this is a time when, you know, like, you're supposed to bring this offering to the temple, but they say, well, you know, you're supposed to take care of your father and mother. But they say, well, you don't have to take care of your father and mother as long as you bring that gift to the temple. It's okay. It's all good. I know what God's law says, but we want to do what profits us and makes us look good. But Jesus rebukes them in chapter 15 and verse 7. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. I think that's what Jesus is really getting to even in this passage. Is your teaching, is your faith or your religious practice only about human rules or is it really about a relationship with Jesus Christ and who he is and that you are convinced and that you have been changed from the inside out and that you want to live for the kingdom of heaven? And so getting ready as we move into the close, and I want to steal a little bit of Jim Thunder for his teach next week. Because you can say, whoa, James, this is very heavy. What do I do with all of this? Don't worry. Come back next week. Jim's going to make you feel better. He's going to ground you in the truth some more of like, what in the world? Because in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, it says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. So what Jesus is saying, the way you don't, be in, you don't walk in deception is the things that you've heard me teach and preach to you today, go put them into practice. Live as children of the kingdom of heaven and that you will not have built your house upon the rock and that at the end when your house is tested and tried, it will stand. So I want to close and remind us of our three questions. 
how do I recognize if I'm on the narrow way and how do I enter the narrow gate? How do I recognize the difference between good fruit and bad fruit? And how do I know if I'm a true disciple of Jesus Christ? Y'all ready? Y'all have been writing and taking notes and I appreciate you staying with me. I'm about to give you the answer to the test. Are you ready for it? Get your pens out because this is, this is a good one. You want to write this? No, I'm kidding. You don't have to write. This is on your Bible app, right? You ready? The only sure answer to any of these questions is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with a community of followers of Christ who are willing to be honest with you even if it wounds you. Can I say that one, one more time for you? The only sure answer to any of these questions is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship with a community of Christ followers who are willing to be honest with you even if it wounds you. You're like, whoa, James, that doesn't sound like nice Christians there. Wound me? That's from the word of God. It says, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. The most loving thing you could do as a Christ follower is walk with your brothers and sisters who are the few people on the narrow path and be honest with them to help them conform to the image and will of God. That's why community is so important here at New Heights. It's not just because there's some new cool gadget thing going. It's something that God has established from the beginning. It is not good that any of us walk alone because when we are alone is when Satan does the best job of his deception. He did it to Eve and Adam in the garden. He did it to Cain at that moment. And anytime he gets us off by ourselves, it's like that predator on the savannah. He looks for the one that's straggling away from the pack to devour them in deception. So as we get ready to close New Heights, I know that was a hard and heavy teach, right? It was hard for me as a therapist. I want you, let me ground you back and bring you back in. Because I hope you hear in this passage, God is saying, come have relationship with me. That's the only way that this false prophet can't get you. Be in relationship with me and be in connection and relationship with each other. So today I want to encourage you. Maybe you said, am I on the narrow way? Have I really surrendered to the teaching of Jesus Christ? I want to encourage you in this time just to search your heart and really say, I, I, I think this is a good thing to always say, God, where am I in relationship with you? What, who and what is influencing me? And are my actions lining up with the kingdom of God? And maybe you might, at the end, you'll come up. Maybe you want to pray with someone right where you are. Maybe it's your community group to say, you know what? I really should have been struggling walking in this narrow way, and I felt like I've let deception in. Maybe there's ways in which God has exposed ways where you've allowed false teaching, deception, or some other form of darkness into your life that you need to repent of and that you need to, to get out of your life. And maybe you've been relying on your own energy and your own works to get yourself into heaven. Maybe you've made an idol of certain cultural icons, whether it's nation, ethnicity, financial power, or your political position. And you say, you know what? I need to really surrender to make sure that I'm living out the culture and the kingdom of heaven first and foremost. I thank you, New Heights. Can I pray with you as we get ready to close this out? Jesus, we thank you so much that you have let us know what the true kingdom of heaven is and how we can walk in your kingdom. And God, we thank you. I pray that everyone hearing this voice will make that choice to enter the narrow gate. I pray that you will open our eyes and no form of deception will be able to lead us away from your love and that take us into destruction. And Jesus, don't even let us deceive ourselves in trying to do things on our own terms, in our own way, and do religious activities while still missing the mark of your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.